Worthy, worthy, worthy. 
sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree, His grace flows down and covers me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree, as grace flows down and covers me. It covers me. It covers me. It covers me. chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let's pray together. Father, you tell us to hold fast of our confession. And the reason you tell us to hold fast because you're a faithful God. You're a God of truth. You cannot lie. You're a God of hope because you brought hope to us. Lord, help us not look to other things that brings false hope. Let's look to you who brings eternal hope, present hope, and hope for tomorrow. Lord, I know there's a lot of people who are struggling out there. But Father, I pray that they turn to you because you are our hope. Let us hold fast to it. Let us not let go. Let us not waver. Let's be solid in our faith because you are our rock and we can trust you. And we ask all these things in your precious name of Christ. Amen. Can move the 
same forever. The author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave, oh Savior, he can move the mountain, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, the author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, oh, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, for for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name. Church families, it's Austin coming to you live from the living room. Hey, I know there's been a lot of talk this week. I've been watching it come across as we've been talking about my beard. So let's just address my beard. I started growing it and then I just said, oh, I hate it. But then all of a sudden social media takes place and Pastor Charles makes a comment. Steve Cook even told me I look like Kenny Rogers from The uh, Gambler. And I love that. And I thought, oh man, I look old. I got to shave this. But John Facciotti, John, I know you're watching. You saved it. You told me to keep the beard. The beard's still here. So welcome to First Baptist Families to our living room set as we talk today about patience. Now, I know kids, you don't quite understand this, so let me bring back something to you. Parents, you will know what these are. Kids, you probably don't know right off. They're not cupcake holders. These are actually ice trays. Now, a long time ago, you couldn't go and just get ice out of your refrigerator freezer. You had to make your own ice. And there were trays that did this. And my grandmother would even put Kool-Aid into the ice trays, and we would make ice tray Kool-Aid. So when you pop the ice out, it would go into your drink, and it was colored and flavored. Now, it would take a long time. And I would get so frustrated because I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And sometimes we would even do experiments. Like we would put Coke in it or Fanta Orange. And that was a big thing in my day to get a Fanta Orange. And we would put those in there and we would wait, 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 wait. But it would take hours. And my grandma would always say, be patient. I have a trouble with patience. I, I, 
sometimes I want it right now. And when we look at that, God tells us a lot about patience. Right now, we're having to be patient in our homes. We're having to do things a little differently, and we have to wait, and, and sometimes we get frustrated. Paul in Ephesians says this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, in all things we do to, to have a worthy life according to God, the very first step, he says, is be patient with others. Now, patient with others is hard. And maybe you'll know. Let, let, me, let me point this out, parents. Um, your kids are watching in the back seat when you're at a green light and you're ready to go and the car in front of you doesn't go and you... Bah, bah. Patience. Patience is hard for us. We want to go. We want to go. We want to go. We want to be able to drive into fast food and get our food and eat in two minutes. I'm wearing a baseball jersey. You want know to learn playing baseball? Patience. Waiting on that pitch. It's so hard for me because my dad would always say, never swing at the first pitch. Guess what I did every time? I swung. Why? Because I didn't know what I was going to get. I just wanted to swing and hit. Patience. Sometimes patience teaches us that something better is coming. In Corinthians, a verse that we hear a lot about in weddings, but we want to think about this in our life. It says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So it's basically saying, if, if I don't practice a life of love, then what, what is my life worth? But then it goes further and says this, For love is patient, love is kind. Now, think about this. If love is patient and God tells us to live a life of love, we're supposed to live a life also of patience, waiting on that which God is preparing for us. It's hard. It's like these ice trays. We're just waiting. We're waiting. We know it's going to be awesome. We know it's going to be good. These ice cubes are made of Fanta orange, and it's going to be awesome to be able to put those in my drink. But we have to wait. Because if we don't, we're just drinking Fanta orange and not having Fanta orange ice, ice cubes. Patience. God is teaching us something through all of this. God is teaching us something that, that he is preparing a place for us. He is preparing an opportunity for us if we'll only pray and watch and wait. That's Austin coming to you live from the living room. Savior 
chosen to be with us this morning and thank you for for allowing us to come into your home as well and uh, we really uh, appreciate it very much we don't take it for granted and we know that you're there probably with your family once again this Sunday having church on the couch and we just want you to know how honored we are that you would allow us to come into your home and to sing some songs of worship and praise and to share with you some truths that we think are making the difference in our lives at this very difficult moment in all of our lives. Somebody said to me the other day, do you think that we will get back to normal? And I quickly replied with really without even thinking about it. I said, gosh, I hope not. There are some things that we probably don't want to go back to post COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Truth be told, just before this pandemic struck our planet, pastors all over the world were lamenting, especially in the Western world, of how church was becoming so complacent. Seems to be so many were just going through the motions. Uh, Maybe something deep in our hearts and souls was really missing It's so easy to get to a place like that, I think, to a place of complacency, especially when you seem to have just about everything in your life. And in the Western world, we really do. We're so very fortunate to live like we do. When so many 
around the world don't have the privileges that we do. It's not something that we should feel guilt over, but it is something that we should, in our hearts, be totally grateful to God that we have been blessed to live, especially in this wonderful country of ours. I thought that we would jump right into the Word this morning and look at a passage of Scripture found in the third chapter of the Apostle John's revelation of Christ in the last days of earth. As apocalyptic as the book of Revelation is, we are not going to focus on the end times matters, but on a very real matter. I think that every individual Christian faces a time or two in his or her life, and I think the church was facing this very thing. It wasn't a physical epidemic, but maybe it was something that was spiritually going on in the life of the church just a few months ago. In Revelation 3, John records the words of Jesus to seven representative churches. Now, these were very real churches. These were places where people were gathering on Sunday, the day that Christ rose from the dead, to worship and celebrate the risen Christ. Some of these churches were not just a church. They were a grouping of churches or a collection of churches. And they represented all of the church at that time, many of them represented, in fact, the church throughout the church age. And let's face it, we are living in the church age. We're right at that time before Christ returns. And so since the, the command of Christ to go into all the world to share the gospel was given, we still continue to be and to live and to flourish in the church age. One day Christ will return. And the church age will end. But in this intermediary period, here we are just sharing our lives, living out the mission of Christ's church in the world. Some theologians who subscribe to a certain biblical interpretation of Revelation 3, in fact, believe that we're living in the Laodicean age of the church. I'm not one who necessarily subscribes to that interpretation, but it is very interesting. I think that we probably have at times in our lives been living a Laodicean kind of life, a church at times that has been a bit more Laodicean in our approach to life. And it's probably not a good thing, too, because we read in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, the scripture says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea I write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that they are neither hot nor cold. And I wish that you were one or the other. And so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, that I have acquired wealth, that I do not need a thing. But you don't even realize that you are wretched and poor and pitiful and blind and naked. And so I counsel you to buy from me gold that is refined in the fire so that you can become rich. White clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. A salve to put on your eyes so that you can finally begin to see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am and I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to eat. To be with that person that they might be with me, that we might abide forever. To the one who is victorious, I give you the right to sit on, on my throne with me, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, I was thinking about the idea of eternal life awaiting us. We all 
are going to experience eternal life, the hot and the cold, the spiritually alive, the spiritually dead. We might say the saved or the unsaved. We're all going to have an eternal life. Some will experience eternal life with God in a glorious place called heaven and others will be separated forever from God in a horrible place called hell. And I think this is a little bit of what the Spirit is telling the angel who was actually the pastor of the church at Laodicea. I know that this passage can be a bit cryptic and it was meant to be a bit cryptic. John is exiled on the island of Patmos in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and he's writing to his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He's not trying to be bold in what he's saying, although he's trying to boldly speak the truth of God. He's speaking apocalyptically though, cryptically, so that others might not know what he is saying and the Roman authorities might not confiscate his writing to the churches. But this is the message of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. Laodicea was one of those interesting towns in in the sense that it was on a major trade route. It was on actually two major trade routes of Rome. It was right in between Hierapolis and Colossae. Hierapolis was known for its famous hot springs and Colossae was known for its beautiful spring wells that had such wonderful, crystal, clear, cold, purified water coming up from the depths. And right in the middle is the Laodicean church an illustration of what was going on, not physically in the geographical makeup of those three cities, but was what was going on deep in the hearts of the people of the Laodicean church. They had grown so accustomed to handling all of their needs for themselves that they had forgotten that to rely upon God is exactly where God wants us to be. God does not want us to be self-sufficient. He wants us, in fact, to fully rely upon him. For when we do, we're able to be in tune. We are attuned to the spirit of God living through us who lead to, who channels his work, the work of God through his people to reach a community, to reach a country, to reach a world for Christ. I think this passage of scripture says two very important things. Won't take long this morning, but I I did want to say that, and I think it's quite obvious we can read and easily discover these principles. One is that we, we, we can't go back to lukewarm living. One of the things we cannot do when we go back, when everything does seem to get back to quote unquote normal after this pandemic is gone, we can't go back to lukewarm living. We've got to find a more appropriate way to live out our lives. Lukewarm Christians are usually very ambivalent about Jesus everywhere but the church. They live with a take him or leave him kind of philosophy about their faith, except on Sundays. And that's where they turn up the heat. They put on the smile, they dust off the Bible. They come and they participate for an hour or so in church. Jesus is saying to the church in Laodicea, maybe he's saying to us, maybe he's saying this to the Western world church, maybe to you as an individual, maybe to me, that it's time to set aside the lukewarm living of the past. We can't go back there after all that we've been through. Because the scripture is so very clear too. God hates a lukewarm Christian. How about for the rest of our lives, we put down lukewarm living and we never go back. I was in one of my favorite restaurants not too long ago and I was really hungry for one of my favorite meals. It was lasagna. 
And they brought it out to me and it looked so good, not even thinking about it. And I was so hungry at the time. I put my fork right into it and I scooped a big uh, helping right into my mouth. And I nearly spit it out because it was, let's just say, less than lukewarm. It was kind of chilly. Not the way I was wanting to eat my lasagna at that wonderful restaurant. I was expecting it to be hot and gooey and, and the cheese melting. And I just really should have looked a little more closely at my meal. I'd had it so many times before, I didn't even think about it. Well, I made a joke to the waiter. The manager came over, who's a friend, and we got to talking and... I got a little silly about it and uh, he wanted to comp my meal. I said, no, 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 I wanna, come on, I wanna pay for my meal, but I do want a hot meal. And I wondered that day, Leslie and I were riding home, I wonder if that's the way God feels about us sometimes. Kind of just, he's expecting something totally different than what he has actually gotten. From those of us who follow Jesus. I don't think lukewarm living is what God had in mind for his church. And if that has been pretty consistent with the way you've been living your life, I want to challenge you as we start to open our doors again, as we start to slowly try to find our way back to a place where we were physically Maybe spiritually, it's not the place we need to get back to at all. Are we going to ever get back to normal? I'm still going with my answer. Gosh, I hope not. Time to end the idea that lukewarm living is going to take us to the spiritual places where God wants us to go. And then that sort of quickly brings me to my, my, my final point. It's we must... Never go back to lukewarm living, but we must also move on to heart, hot hearted living. No lukewarm living, but hot hearted living. This pandemic has caused us to realize some really important things. It's caused us to realize that there are some really unimportant things. Maybe some things that just need to be removed from your. Uh, weekly endeavors for the rest of your life. Maybe move them off your calendar altogether. It's really caused us to see what, what really is important. It's allowed us, like the Laodiceans were being told that they didn't seem to be able to grasp, to perceive things that they should. I think this pandemic in one sense, as horrible as it is, has made us realize what really is important to us. It's helping some people to move away from complacency and, and move on to something more purposeful. It's helped us to rearrange some of our priorities in our lives. And I pray that on some level, we never go back. We move away from lukewarm living, we move on to hot-hearted living. Do you know what a fanatic is? It's someone who is hopelessly bent on living for something bigger than themselves. Maybe it's your favorite football team. Lord knows the Georgia football fanatics in the fall football season. They're just everywhere. And more power to the, to the red and black of the Georgia Bulldogs. They're fanatics. But the same is true probably of the football team of your choice. Now look, I think about how fanatical people can be on Saturday and before this pandemic, how unfanatical people could be on the very next day on Sunday. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe you gave all of your screaming and shouting away on Saturday. Well, maybe moving forward, Either you begin to shift your priorities from a Saturday to a Sunday fall weekend schedule, or maybe you, you reserve some of the cheering and the celebrating for Sunday morning as well, moving into the fall. 
Moving away from the lukewarm living on Sunday to that hot-hearted living that you're accustomed to on Saturday when you're cheering on your favorite football team. Just a thought. You know, I'm not sure people would, back before this pandemic, I'm not sure they would miss a Sunday, excuse me, a Saturday football game. But I know that some and maybe more than should would miss a Sunday morning worship service. Now, I'm grateful to God that he's not taking attendance. God has a lot more important things to do. And, and, and God's a gracious God. And it's not about uh, how much time you spent sitting in a Bible study class or sitting in a church pew or a church chair on Sunday mornings celebrating, but it does reveal just how important God is to us when we gather together to worship the Lord. It's a sign of how warm, how hot, or maybe how cold one's heart really is for God. God alone should be the king of our hearts. Are you hot-hearted for God? This pandemic has proven that Christ's church will prevail, that we will overcome, that we will adapt, and we will do what it is that we have to do to make sure that we continue to celebrate the Christ who is the Savior of our lives and our hearts and our souls, but also the Savior of the world, the one who overcame death in the grave. We'll find a way to get to you, whether it's church on the couch, whether it's a drive-in church like many churches have been doing, or whether it is that we all get back here together really soon to celebrate the risen Christ. But he's alive. And knowing that Christ Jesus paid the ultimate price to die on Calvary's cross to save our soul, that there was nothing lukewarm about what he did on Calvary's cross. But out of his grand love, his his unfathomable, indescribable love for us. He gives up his life so that we might live eternally. As hot-hearted as a love for you and me as that was, it's the very least that we could do. Yeah, many pastors lamented before this pandemic began over the lack of attendance, participation in church activities, or maybe mission outreach, I like what Johnny Hunt said a fanatic is. He said a fanatic is what lukewarm Christians call people who are hot-hearted for God. It's a, it's a bit of a spiritual defense mechanism, if you will. Well, God wants us to move. He wants us to move from lukewarm living. He wants us to move on to hot-hearted living. These are not time, times in which to be lukewarm about anything. Okay, maybe Brussels sprouts, but that's it. But do this. Certainly, it's not one's fortitude to fight this disease that has caused this pandemic, and it's certainly not that we might move on to even more spiritual complacency. This has been an opportunity for us to reboot, to reset our lives, to rethink spiritually what it is I'm going to do, not only physically, not only socially, but also spiritually what I intend to do when we get back to whatever we call normal. But we're praying for you. As we each, and I want to challenge you this week to wrestle with these ideas. Hey Lord, is there an area of my life where I'm lukewarm with you God, I want to be hot-hearted for you. I want, to, I want to change something about my life. I want to rearrange some priorities. I want to discover a deeper purpose for my life now that we're beginning to get beyond this scary pandemic. Let me pray with you about it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your truth. May your words to the Laodicean church Help us to think what you might be saying to us. And may it move us quickly from lukewarm living.
to hot-hearted living. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning at First Baptist Church. It is so great to have you worship with us. He is Lord. Let's just continue to remember that through the week. Let's sing this together. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee shall